Hey everyone, Kaz here from Two Book Watch Knobs. You have made it all the way to episode 268. Uh, welcome your eyes, or I guess your ears, if you're uh, tuning in on the podcast version. Your eyes and your ears do not deceive you. I am running episode 268 solo, but I thought it would be a ton of fun to do uh, two things. So first of all, if you're watching this on YouTube, you're getting, you're getting a very different experience than if you're just listening to the audio version. The reason that I'm saying that is I am actually currently testing out my new YouTube setup uh, with this episode because I'm going to be doing a State of the Watch collection. So what I would share is this. If you want to get the most out of this episode, you can listen to the audio version. I'm going to do my best to be as, uh, as descriptive as possible through the pieces of my collection I'm going to be talking through and everything like that. But there's just going to be some things that are only going to really work on the video portion. So uh, if you want to get the most out of the episode, I would recommend going to the YouTube uh, for Two Work Watch Knobs and watching it there, subscribing, and then letting us know in the comments what your thoughts are and everything like that. Um, but I thought it'd be fun to do that, to test the YouTube rig, to, uh, cause I have a two camera system. I have camera one, which is looking at, at, at me and my dumb face and it's camera two, which is going to be a focus here on, on some watches that I'll be talking about. I just gave a bit of a spoiler for the first watch that I'm going to be, there we go, going through. Um, but really I think my collection has gone through a lot of different uh narratives and iterations i've shared very very different thoughts about my collection really over the past two years about how i wanted it to evolve and how i wanted it to look like and there was the great Kaz purge of like a year or two ago where i went a, a, i went i went a little mad with power and i sold uh, i sold a lot of things ended up buying one of them back which we'll talk about now and so i think it'd be really fun to just do a state of the watch collection Go through all my pieces. I'll be talking through case dimensions of everything, movement quirks about everything, uh, wearing experiences about a lot of the watches that I have as well. So with that said, I'm going to do my best to cover all the watches. My goal for a long time was to have a six watch collection. I do not have a six watch collection. <laughs> I have nine watches um, that I'm going to be going through uh, with everyone here today. So again, Go and check this out on YouTube if you want to see the watches that I'm talking about or if you want to listen. And then go check it out on YouTube. That is totally an option as well. But what I will do is, uh, let's see here. I got my coffee. I got my very shitty coffee. I made really bad coffee this morning. So that's going to be my recording partner uh, for episode 268. Episode 268, Kaz and his very shitty coffee that he made. I got my water that I'm going to break open in case of emergencies. So with that, um, for the 268th time, Solo or not, I have to honor tradition and do a wrist check. And I thought it would be fun for my wrist check to start with my first, uh, with my first state of the watch collection piece. And so I will switch to camera one or camera two. I can't remember which camera this is. But first piece I want to talk about in the collection is my little Seiko SNK805. This is the first automatic. I think really the first watch I actually ended up ever uh, getting. So this is, but really this is the first watch I put a little bit of research into. I put a little bit of thought into. I had a bit of an idea of what I wanted to do with this watch. This watch I really later learned came to define my particular taste and really what I look for in watches that really spoke to me. I mean that's that's that that's the truth about it. So. Wearing dimensions on this in terms of case dimensions, I'll talk about the strap. This is not, <laughs> this is not the strap the watch comes with. Uh, I have my notes over here, so that way I get everything right. In terms of wearing dimensions, this uh, my Seiko SNK805, it is 37 millimeters in diameter. It is 43 millimeters lug to lug. So lug to lug, I mean, you know, lug to lug there. That's actually a really important measurement that I think folks need to pay a bit more attention to because that gives you a bit more of an illustrative appearance, uh, uh, experience about what it's actually going to be like on your wrist, especially if you have a smaller wrist like me. I, my wrist is approximately, uh, it's like 6.75 inches. So just use that as reference for as we go through the pieces and I talk through case dimensions and everything like that today. And thickness or thinness here, as it were, is, um, is 11 millimeters. This is using the Seiko uh, very classic I mean, for a long time, it was the ubiquitous damn near bulletproof movement, but it is using the Seiko 7S26 um, movement. It's about 40 hours of power reserve. It does not it does not manually wind. It does not hack. But it looks really cool with the exhibition case back. <laughs> uh, this is the day date, obviously. It has all that fun stuff and everything like that. Um, 
This watch is really special to me because this is actually the watch that probably... How can I phrase this? This is the watch that got Michael and I to be friends. That got Michael and I... Michael, my better half from Two Broke Watch Knobbery. This is the watch that got he and I, I think, really on very similar and the same wavelengths in regards to watches, but also just life, friendship, you know, just, just drinking wine, hanging out, talking watches. Not really. We were working at the same place, and so I was working there, and that place was just a total shit show. And so um, a little while after he started, I kind of made the decision that, oh, I was going to try to find a job elsewhere. And I, I got this weird idea in my head that I'm like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to interview. I need a nice watch. I need a nice watch to impress someone because I just assumed for some reason that if someone was interviewing me, someone who was interviewing me was going to be having, uh, uh, you know, a nice watch and they wouldn't know about watches or something. And so I remember, I, I didn't know to what extent Mike was deep into it, but <clears throat> I knew Mike, well, I knew Mike liked watches. Mike liked watches. That was his thing. Um, and so I remember I asked him, I asked him something like, Hey, what would a good watch be for me to get that would like impress like a watch collector or something like that? And I remember he shared a few links. One of them was actually a very good piece. It's probably one of the, um, one of the cooler pieces that ever kind of came out, at least at the time. Um, this was in 2015 or so on the, on the blog to watch. It was, uh, there's two parts now, but what back then there was just one part. It was, um, the watch that gets the nod from watch snobs or watches that gets the nods from watch snobs, something like that. And then, then, and then they did a part two, uh, as well. And we got a nice, um, shout out on the part two piece as well. But, uh, of all the information that Mike shared with me, this piece, switching to camera one or camera two, whichever camera this is, this piece was actually one of the ones that was featured in there. So the Seiko SNK series is discontinued. This line of watches does not, it's not currently in production anymore. You can still buy them, but, I think when I last looked, you're spending like 150, I think over 200 bucks in certain instances. So the original Seiko 5 SNK uh, uh, series, there's a green dial, which is the 805. This is the one that I got. There is a uh, blue dial. There's like a cream color sort of dial. There's a black dial, which was very popular. And then for a while there was a, I think it was like an Amazon exclusive or like a limited edition um, red dial version that came out. Uh, those have since been discontinued and have now been replaced with really this new sort of, uh, I'll call it a vibe because I can't really think of any other way of describing it, this new vibe that Seiko is really kind of putting into the Seiko 5 line. Um, this sort of field series has been reimagined into the Seiko 5 sports field style collection. It's, it's, a, it's a mouthful. So what I would share is this. If you liked the, 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 the feel of this watch, at 37 millimeters, it wears amazingly. It is one of those things where it hits all the quintessential points of an everyday watch. If you like the size dimensions, if you like the field dial, so the field dial is where on the outer perimeter you have your, um, your uh, minute minute increments of five and then on the interior dial you have you know your kind of like i guess technically it's the hour on a field dial you might have military time on the inside so it would be one to twelve on the outside and then you know 13 to 24 on the inside but this is like a this is like a field style dial uh with these sword hands and everything like that you can get something similar to this in the current seiko 5 uh it's a mouthful god damn it seiko 5 field sports style collection I'm Ron Burgundy. Uh, but what's funny is if you, I think it's basically the same price as these old discontinued ones. So what I would say is if you were interested in this, check out uh, that. I'll try to have a link for it on the Seiko site or, or on an Amazon if that's easier. Um, for the, sorry about that, I'm still, still learning all these camera angles. For this modern iteration, I would just get the new one. Honestly, it's a little different, but it's very close in spirit to these ones. The only reason I would say get the new one is that it has um, a 4R movement in there. So it's going to hack. It's going to manually wind. I think it's a little more accurate. Not really by much. Also, not that it really matters. So uh, if anyone remembers the Seiko Midfield Collection, that is basically what the newer versions of these are. I don't think they're called the Midfield Collection on the actual Seiko website. So, uh, quick note about the strap, and then I want to move on to the next piece. This is not the strap it came with. So, when I got this watch, 
I literally knew nothing about watches. And when Mike was talking to me about this watch, he had one of these SFKs. Uh, he didn't have the green one. He had a different dial color. And he said he said something offhand like, you know, oh, yeah, when I got it, I just cut the strap off and I put this NATO on it. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, that sounds cool. And I just walked away. I walked away thinking he actually cut the strap off. I didn't know anything about spring bar tools or, um, you know, uh, strap changes or NATOs. I was just like, it's like oh, I just could cut the strap off. You just put something else on. That's fine. And so I ordered the watch. I remember I was very nervous because I never spent that much on a watch. I'd never spent like 70 bucks on a watch. And I was so scared. My man, how the times, how the times have changed. As we'll, as we'll see it throughout the collection, I wish I didn't spend more than 75 bucks on a watch. Oh, God, terrible coffee. I'm just going to power through. Um, I ordered the watch. It got here. And the first thing I did was I took, <laughs> I took some scissors. And I immediately just ran the scissors through, like, the spring, like, against the spring bar and the fabric strap and just took the strap off. And I just threw it out. So I just, I just don't have the original strap um, for this watch. What this strap is, this is actually an ostrich leather strap that I got um, as part of a purchase I did on Reddit. I bought an old Omega Seamaster 30 1962.286 caliber. It was a beautiful watch. Um, it's not with me anymore, but that watch came on this uh, ostrich leather strap. And so I love this strap because these darker holes here that you see, I guess those are actually, I forgot, I don't know. Listen, I'm not like a bird expert or anything like that, but the t I don't know what the technical term is, but these are the holes that the actual feathers for the, the bird came out of. These feather pores, feather pore? Let me get this into focus. Boom. There you go. Appreciate all you being patient with me while I learn new equipment and new things while you all look at my face, my, my dumb, dumb face. Uh, I think the actual visual presentation of this strap with this dial is just perfect. I'm totally into it. Uh, and so that original strap is gone. This is now the strap for this watch. I think this is probably still my burning house watch. It's a bit tough to say. There's another watch that we're going to talk about, which I'm sure most speak, most folks know what I'm talking about, which might be a close contender for my burning house watch. So by burning house watch, I mean my house is on fire, which is obviously a terrible experience that I never want anyone to go through. But if my home were on fire and I could only grab one watch, what am I going to grab? Right now, it's probably this. I'm probably going to change my mind as the episode goes on, but that's fine. So this is the Seiko 5 SNK805, my first watch uh, I guess ever. Boom. Let me do this here. Also, I have a lot of lights in my face right now, so if I faint or if I spontaneously begin to sob, I'm fine. It's going to be fine. <laughs> okay, let me see. What do we want to talk about next? Oh, man. Um, let's do... Let's do, let, let's, do the, let's do the next two in order just because I teased it. Yeah, let's do the next two in order. So, camera one, or I guess camera two, whichever, camera, boom. For those of you not on YouTube, we are looking at the Raketa Big Zero. Let me move the hands out of the way so y'all can see the dial. So, the Raketa Big Zero, this is probably one of the more recognizable vintage Soviet watches uh, really around right now, probably tied with the Vostok Amphibia, specifically the Steve Zizow's ship's wheel. Uh, pretty sure it's the ship's wheel. Yeah, ship's wheel, Vostok Amphibia. Um, right up there with like the Vostok Scuba Dude and everything like that. The Raketa Big Zero is incredibly recognizable, uh, particularly because it is a very high contrast, minimal, I would say this is a very minimal dial, but bold, bold impact. So this is actually a really, really, really fun piece for me. I first learned about this watch on, uh, I think I saw it on Reddit actually a long time ago when i first started getting into soviet watches and this watch really launched my early fascination with vintage soviet timepieces so when i say vintage soviet timepieces what am i talking about i'm talking about timepieces that were made in the soviet union and kind of soviet union encompassing countries between the periods technically of 1917 to 1991 1992 Really, nothing was actually being "quote unquote" Soviet produced until like the 1920s or 30s. Um, 
But when I say Soviet watches, that's 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 what I that's what I mean. I don't really know too much about the modern iteration of Raketa because there is now a modern iteration of Raketa, and they have started to produce newer versions, newer updated versions of the Raketa Big Zero. Uh, I have shared my thoughts and opinions about the newer updated versions of the Raketa Big Zero on previous episodes of the show, and in short, I will summarize my thoughts uh, with you here. I do not like them. I do not like Green Eggs and Ham. I do not like them. I, don't, I probably should have remembered that entire Dr. Seuss quote, but the newer versions of the Raketa Big Zero don't really capture the magic of this one. The, the, the first big thing is they cor <laughs> they corrected the hands. So when I say they corrected the hands, this little stubby hour hand, in terms of... How can I phrase this? If we were to, like, if we were to quantify orological best practices... Orological best practices basically holds that the hour hand is supposed to go and extend right to the hour marker. And then the minute hand is supposed to go and extend right to the minute ticks. Because that's that promotes uh, appropriate legibility. Uh, this does not. This, this is just a short little stubby hand. But it really captures part of the quirk and the charm of this timepiece. In the newer versions, they corrected that. The hour hand goes all the way over there. I think the second hand is a little bit different as well. The watch is also much thicker. We'll talk about that in a few moments. But uh, this watch for me definitely set me off on my journey of really getting into um, vintage Soviet uh, timepieces. You know, I would go to eBay and I would just type in like Raketa on the eBay search results page and I would just go and look at listings. I would go and I would study listings, I would look at dials, I would look at movements, I would cross-reference them with some of the larger uh, kind of knowledge bases of Soviet watches back then. Uh, back then the big ones were Mark Gordon's USSR Time. Uh, Mark Gordon is no longer with us unfortunately and I believe his website lives in a facsimile non-completed version. And the other really big director at the time was Michelle Cuclio. Cuclio? I can't ever say her name, I'm so sorry. Um, those two websites were huge. Uh, uh, the Shell's website specifically for Vossov. There's a lot of amazing, uh, there were a lot of amazing Vossov pieces on there. There are some newer versions or newer websites that are fantastic repositories of Soviet watch knowledge as well. So uh, I'll try to see if I can find some of those and share them either on the episode notes here or in a, a episode coming up if we do another vintage Soviet watch episode. But I would just spend hours looking at listings and everything like that. And then I remember I happened upon this. I knew I wanted a big zero. Uh, and they were kind of popular at the time. You could get them for like 40 bucks back then. Now it's a different story. Now they're a couple hundred bucks. I think I think Raketa launching a new version of this watch did not help prices of these vintage uh, Raketa big zero models. But I remember I was going through the Raketa pages and I saw someone... You know, through the magic of translation error is how I got this watch. Someone listed this watch on eBay as Raketa Big Numerals. So if you were searching for Raketa Big Zero, and a lot of people were back then, this was, I don't know, 2014, maybe? 2014, I think? Uh, if you were if you went to eBay and you typed in Raketa Big Zero, you weren't going to you, you weren't see that person's listing. Um, sorry, person. Uh, unless you typed in Raketa Big Numerals, or if you were like me and just typed in Raketa and looked at every single listing from page 1 to 145 or whatever it was, you weren't going to see it. So that's how I saw this. I went, I checked it out, I looked at the movement and everything like that in here. I'll talk about the movement in a moment. Um, everything made sense about this watch. I was able to pick it up for, I think, like 35 or 40 bucks. Uh, those days are gone. I don't think, <laughs> I don't think you're going to find this watch for that much anymore. Unless you're lucky. I should never say never. Um, these are also frankened a lot, and by frankened I mean they'll replace it with like a paper dial, or it won't quite be right, or the case will be from a different watch, or the case back will sometimes be different. More often than not, it's going to be the dial that's uh, that's different. So let me throw this thing on the wrist here. Stop yammering about this watch. So in terms of case wearing dimensions, the Raketa Big Zero case diameter is approximately 39 millimeters. The lug to lug width, boom, that is just fantastic closer over here come on there we go come on man you know watch is your watch when it just makes you smile when you wear it that's what this watch does for me it's just damn near perfect uh wearing dimensions here 39 millimeters in diameter is 40.5 millimeters lug to lug now it is 11 millimeters in terms of thickness but that includes 
this uh, this this monstrous dome. The dome is a replacement. The original crystal for this watch has uh, uh, an acrylic, um, not really a dome. It's more of like a cylinder. It doesn't it doesn't bevel. It doesn't curve down. It just kind of goes straight up. We'll actually see that on another watch, uh, another vintage Soviet watch that I have here. We'll see a really good example of that. The crystal being a replacement, I'm not too worried about. In all honesty, it's it's. I'm sure the original crystal looked uh, terrible. So <laughs> when you when you want to find non franken time pieces, it's really more hard fixtures that you're worried about. Hands, dial, case, crown. Crystals are fine unless it's something very very specific, uh, like that's indicative of the character of the watch or something like that. Uh, oh yeah, without the without the uh, uh, mad domage, honestly, it's probably maybe eight or nine millimeters in terms of uh, thick or thinness, as it were, but. This is probably a, a close a close second for my burning house watch. Uh, the Raketa Big Zero very much became um, a memory watch for me. I've associated a lot of really good and a lot of really uh, you know not so good memories in my life with with this watch. So you know um, I got engaged in this watch. I got married in this watch. I wore this watch when my son was born, uh, which was a whole ordeal because there was health complications afterwards, and we were in the hospital for seven days and during all those seven days this this was the watch that was um that was with me i've also had health scares personal health scares and a lot of drama with this watch and so i have a lot of sentimentality um just associated with raketa big zero there we go my camera's reversed so i gotta i gotta get used to the picture in picture so this is a close second for for for, for burning house watch let me put both of these under my observation camera here if I were to summarize myself in two watches, I might choose these two. I know that's really weird of me to say because none of these are Kaz Teal. Hashtag. <laughs> hashtag Kaz Teal, which will. Oh, we'll talk about Kaz Teal, guys. There's, 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 there's some Kaz Teal watches coming up. But, um. These were very, these were very, very definitive for me in regards to just how I uh, built my collection. Also, hashtag shout out Tiny Carpet, Tiny Carpet's back. For those who remember some of our, some of our early uh, explorations into uh, the YouTubes, uh, Tiny Carpet was uh, part of those reviews. Tiny Carpet is still here. I'm probably gonna take Tiny Carpet out, just because I think he is maybe messing with the color a little bit. Carpet in, carpet out. Tiny Carpet in. Tiny carpet out. All right. Uh, tiny carpet. All right. Let's see here. The, oh, yeah. The, let me go back to my main camera here. Sorry. Uh, that was the Raketa Big Zero. Oh, really quick about the movement. I'm so sorry. This is using a manual line 18 joule Raketa 2609 caliber. The Raketa 2690. The motherfuck. The Raketa 2609 caliber. Also, I'm doing this all in one take. So I don't like jump cuts, I don't like heavy edits. Michael and I generally don't edit what we do, uh, which probably isn't good. That probably gets us into trouble, but it's fine. Um, <laughs> uh, the Raketa Big Zero uses the Raketa 2609 caliber. This is a very interesting movement. It is an 18 joule manual wind movement. Uh, I couldn't tell you what the accuracy rating is on here. Maybe a few minutes a day, <laughs> honestly. So when the Soviets were... I think it's really interesting to understand a little bit of the history of the Soviet Union and just how the world was industrializing at that time, early 1800s, leading into the 1900s, um, you know, just before uh, things kicked off in 1917, when all other nations around Russia at the time were industrializing and figuring out ways to mass produce relatively high quality pieces of material and they were figuring out how to uh, generally build up infrastructure and all of these amazing things that were occurring to help propel society. The problem was at the time in Russia, none of that was occurring. There was no centralized concerted effort towards an industrial revolution. There wasn't really an effort to pull Russia out of a primarily like manually agrarian sort of society. They were still using very old uh, uh, agricultural practices for growing food, but there, were, there weren't really any sort of um, civil programs or infrastructure programs to support 
uh, actual uh, citizens and people living in uh, cities and villages and towns and things like that. A lot of what was occurring that was coming from the government was just, um, how, do, how can I phrase this? Pre-Bolshevik Revolution, the government in Russia was mainly, I think, still czars, basically. But all that amounted to was just funneling money from citizens to the czarist regime in regards to, you know, art, parties, uh, little wars. Lots of little wars and skirmishes were occurring and things like that. And so all of this was at the detriment of the people. And so while everyone was industrializing... While countries were industrializing and focusing on their citizens at the time before the 1917 revolution, uh, that was not happening in Russia. So 1917 happens, revolution happens, all that stuff goes down. Uh, I'm doing my best. To, I'm doing my best to get to the Rakeda Big Zero because I realize it's been 25 minutes. Who dog y'all? This is a state of the Warches collection. Um, let me go back to my dumb face here. Boom, camera one or two. I should label. Just kidding. Okay, this is camera two. I actually did label it. Pass cas came through. This is camera two. Man, my face is really bright. I gotta fix that. Um, after the revolution, the country had to figure out how can we competitively industrialize and not, and this is the big thing, not rely on outside manufacturing for things that we need for everyday life. And in regards to timepieces, that basically amounted to what can we manufacture in-house to not be reliant on uh, American, German, and Swiss timepieces i have some pieces on the website that i've written uh that go into a little bit more history um in regard to this but what i'll say is what makes the rakana 2609 movement in here really really special is that it is a very simple very basic constructive movement really with the idea of being easily serviceable now it's probably very difficult these days because if you had to do a part replacement you'd have to you know cannibalize another Raketa 2609 but that was basically the idea when they were coming up with movements and we'll talk we'll actually talk more about Soviet watch movements because I have two of the Soviet watches here um, but the Raketa 2609 I think what speaks to the universality and the reliability of this movement is that the modern iteration of Raketa even though I'm not a giant fan of them still uses the 269 caliber base they uh, have added a rotor uh to it they've, they've i think they've added like a module rotor to it so it's the two six i have no idea what the reference is i don't know modern raketa <laughs> but basically it's very thick it's still the same two six caliber it's even still the same machines i think if y'all can believe that that they were making these original two six zero nine the movements on so that is the raketa big zero i'm gonna put this down i have got to sail through these a lot faster. What are we? What are we talking about next, guys? Camera two, bam. Uh, let's do a coffee sip and look. Oh man, let's wild card it. You want to wild card it? Hold on. Okay, I thought my son was crying. I might be waking up my son. That's fine. Yeah, he's definitely awake. That's fine. I'm gonna power through it. Okay, let me do camera one. Who recognizes this watch? Does anyone recognize or remember this watch? We haven't talked about this one in a long time. This is the Orient Star Semi Skeleton Limited Edition Diver Reference RK AT0106E. Gotta love those Orient Star and Orient references. This is a really interesting watch. This isn't obviously, this obviously is in a version of Cas Teal. Ooh, Teal. There it is. Boom. God, this is a beautiful watch. This is also a chonky-ass motherfucker. This is a very large watch. Uh, case dimensions and wearing experience on this watch are very large. Diameter, this is 43.5 millimeters. Lug to lug, it is 49 millimeters. Thickness, it is approximately uh, 14 millimeters. It does sit very nice just because of how the case is angled. We'll see what those lugs are doing. So it is comfortable. It is just definitely like... Here, I mean... It's like a it's like a peanut next to a walnut. He said effacingly. So this was a really really interesting purchase. I learned about these <clears throat> post full Seiko Epson acquisition of Orient, and so by that I mean there's a very specific time period in Orient Orient watches uh, 
manufacturing history where pre-full Epson takeover, Orient was operating, you know, kind of independently from uh, Epson, the Seiko Epson Corporation, which is part of a holding group, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, there was a little bit of, of share ownership of Epson in Orient Star, but after, I think it was 2018 or 2019, I have to double check, uh, Seiko Epson had full ownership of Orient and Orient Star. After that, we began to experience really a lot of cool uh, new kind of focus here. Actually, I'll focus here. New uh, revitalization in Orient. They redid all of the uh, in-house uh, Orient automatic movements. So one of the really cool value propositions that Orient offers as a affordable, relatively affordable. Um, Japanese watch brand is all of their movements are in-house and all of their movements are automatic and for a long time they were operating on a version of automatic movements that were uh, I think based originally off of the Seiko 7 S26 that they I think purchased I don't know, it was the it was an old Seiko automatic movement that they purchased some of the patent rights to or at least some of the usage licenses to I think in the 70s or 80s and then they started to iterate on that and eventually became their own uh, in-house movements and everything like that. After the Seiko Epson full acquisition uh, occurred, all automatic movements were revitalized. In particular, that's actually what ended up launching uh, the Mako 2s. If you remember when the Mako 2s came out, those things are still amazing, by the way. Uh, you know, it's, it's that new movement that came out. It had improvements such as manual winding, hacking, and improved uh, accuracy. So the movement in here is part of that new uh, resurgence. This thing is using the, um, I believe this is only used in the Orient Stars, uh, Orient Star collection. So, you know, um, Orient Star Standard Contemporary, the Diver Series as well, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about. This is the F6R42. It has a 50 hour power reserve. Uh, it's plus minus, plus, okay, so it's plus 25 seconds, minus 15 seconds a day. I've heard of people getting much better accuracy ratings with this um, than that, obviously. But I learned about this watch after the Seiko Epson uh, takeover of Orient, and I saw this dial and I was like, I need that watch. But what's funny is I saw this watch with a leather strap originally, and then I started to wonder, oh, hey, is there a version of it with the bracelet? There is, and that was actually this version, which is the limited edition version, the reference that I... Um, just shared now. So I reached out to Sega to Sega Japan who have made uh, JDM purchases through before because this is also a JDM model and uh, I asked him about this. He said he can get it, got it, sent it to me and that, that's that's the story of this watch. It has an exhibition case back as well. You can see they try their best to decorate these movements pretty well. You can see some of the stripes, some perlage, easier there we go you can see that a little bit better there this is a beautiful watch um i had marked this for sale during the great cast purge of watch collection pieces just because um i figured i didn't wear it too much but honestly and and and, uh, and i was right i didn't wear it a lot at the time but i'm glad i kept it because i do think it looks fantastic and it is a really great addition to the whole history of uh, of Kaz Teal. So uh, this is a bit of a wild card. I want to wear this one more. I think it photographs beautifully. I love the contrast between the uh, black matte bezel white markers with the stainless steel bracelet and case and this Kaz Teal dial. The only knock I'll give this watch, other than its size, which isn't even that big, is it is really unlike, it is, it is illegible. The power reserve kind of screws up the legibility. The little open heart screws up the legibility. And the way these hands work, let me, let me uh, show you here what we're dealing with. You see how the back of the hands stick out? That really kind of screws up your legibility if you're trying to read this thing in a pinch. Uh, so if you were to buy this, uh, I would just buy it based on looks. You know, I wouldn't really expect it to be super legible. Uh, the bezel is really, really nice. There is basically no play. The wiggling you see is my hand moving. There's basically no play in this at all. Let me go back to 12, relatively to 12. There we go. Um, 
this is a fun watch. Expect to see uh, expect to see some more of this watch. I'll probably try and do a full uh, video review of this timepiece as well. Let me see. Where are we on time? Okay, it could be worse. What do we want to talk about next? Uh, oh, let's keep the Castile train going. Let's keep the... Oh my god, you guys. What are we doing? Why haven't we made a bigger deal about this? Can you all see that at home on, on YouTube? Next watch up that we will talk about is the Orient Neo 70s Christmas Chrono. Let me go here and scroll to my actual specs. Boom. Let me switch cameras. I totally, I, I, if you can hear my baby, I totally woke him up. But I'm going to power through. Because that's how much I care about everyone at home. Uh, this is the Orient Christmas Chrono. <laughs> this is a ton of fun. This is part of the Orient Neo 70s collection. The Orient Neo 70s collection, <clears throat> I don't think it's very popular here in the United States. They may actually not even be iterating on it any longer. But the idea with the Orient Neo 70s collection is that it is Orient's way <clears throat> of taking some interesting design tropes of watches that occurred in the 70s and putting a bit of a fun twist on them. So panda dials, faceted crystals, um, interesting chronograph configurations. In particular, this one I believe is a riff on the classic panda dial. What they've done here is they have these pinstripes and you can actually see, a re you can see this really well. This is hard for us to describe on air. The stripes stagger. Pick a top part of the line and follow your eye down and watch the stagger that it does. It's so fascinating. Um, this watch was actually, let me just push the quartz chronograph pusher there. Is it going or did this? Oh, there we go. I need to charge this watch. How funny is that? That's how, that, that's how, that's how much I haven't worn this watch, guys. How bad is that? I actually have another watch I got to change the battery on too. Well, no, this is a, this is a solar quartz chronograph, so I got to get this in the, in the sunlight, but... This is one of the this is one of the first watches that I think launched Kaz Teal. You can see it has this really cool holographic effect. The pinstripes actually change. Uh, man, I'm actually super stoked I'm doing this on YouTube. You can finally see how cool this watch is. Let me get it on wrist for everyone here. Wearing experience on this is actually very nice. It's balanced by two very interesting uh, measurements here. It is 42 millimeters in diameter which is honestly the maximum of what I'm able to wear and could potentially be too big, but it's about 12 millimeters in height. Um, and that's only possible because it's a quartz chronograph. And so the actual wearing experience is very, very nice. It is light uh, as well, which helps with the wearing experience uh, also. It's uh, for, yeah, 42 millimeters in diameter. It is 48 millimeters uh, lug to lug. So this is one of those really nice watches that help me appreciate the concept of a grab and go uh, quartz timepiece, you know, when I can remember to keep this fucking thing charged. <laughs> but um, I learned about this watch. I saw it online. You guys ever experience those watch hunting experiences where you see a photo of a watch, you don't know anything about the, about the brand, you don't know anything about where this watch is or what kind of movement it is or what the material is, blah, blah, blah. You see a watch and you just go, yes, that's the watch. I will, I will climb over dead people to get that watch. Uh, that was very dramatic. That was basically the reaction I had when I first saw uh, an image off, offhandedly online of the Orient uh, Christmas Chrono. This is a limited edition JDM piece that I saw online. I didn't know anything about it. All I saw was the reference number and I was able to find it on eBay through a Japanese retailer. This was very early on in my watch buying career, so I didn't know anything about like Seiya Japan or like other um, watch uh, retailers, JDM based watch retailers or anything like that. So I saw this watch, I didn't know anything about Ori, I didn't know anything about the brand, I had to buy it and I'm glad I did. Uh, it is limited edition, it, there are about a thousand, there are exactly a thousand pieces made. Mine here is, let me see if I can show it to you. Actually, they don't really do this anymore for some reason, but this actually is numbered. Mine is 884 of a thousand. So what's funny is my other Orient Star, my other Orient, my, my, my other Orient, which is the Orient Star, this is also limited edition, but it is not numbered, which I thought was kind of weird. I don't know if you can see that. I do not have a number designation on it. It does say it does say Epson on there. You can see that. 
that's how you can differentiate if you have a Orion that is post uh, Seiko Epson takeover or pre Seiko Epson takeover. Oh, while we're on the topic of Orion, uh, just to put this out there, Orion is owned by Seiko Epson, which is, I believe, a holding company which owns many, many brands, one of which is Seiko. The way the ownership structure is tiered within the um, kind of Seiko Holdings Corporation is that companies operate very distinct and separate from each other. So even though Seiko, you know, the watch manufacturer, and Orion are owned by the same holding company does not mean that one owns or controls the other. Seiko watches doesn't own Orion watches and Orion watches doesn't own Seiko watches. Um, so just to put that out there. Uh, this is a solar quartz movement on the Orion Christmas Chrono. Oh, really quick note about the name. This is a limited edition release. They released in, I believe in Japan for to commemorate Christmas in 2016. And I think I got this in 2017. And so uh, that's why we call it the Christmas Chrono. That's not like an Orient name. That's just something that Michael and I uh, just kind of named this watch. So if you Google Orient Christmas Chrono and you don't really see anything on Orient and you just see chubookwatchnobs.com, well, you're welcome. So, But that's where the name came from. The name came from the fact that it was apparently uh, uh, made to commemorate Christmas in Japan 2016. That is my understanding about the story behind this watch. It is not expensive. I paid, I think, 250 bucks for this watch. This was, this was never intended to be an expensive watch. Um, I haven't seen a version for sale in a long time. You're not going to find this new. You're going to find this from someone who's uh, selling it online. So just wanted to kind of put that disclaimer out there. Uh, as well. Bam. Okay. Let's see. We've got through four watches. We have five watches left. What are we doing? Uh, let's keep the Castile. Let's keep the Castile train uh, going here. Let's go. Boom. Camera two. Or, yeah, camera two. Talk about Grand Seiko. I also wanted to show this camera because uh, I want everyone to understand what the color inspiration was <laughs> for the wall behind me. I fucking love this color. Look at that. Oh, damn camera's reversed. There we go. Man, that is so cool. All right, here, switching cameras. Camera one, boom, bam. This is the Grand Seiko SBGV233 JDM uh, model. This is not a, I do not believe this is a USA model. I could not find this anywhere on um, any Grand Seiko USA website. So really funny story about this watch. Also, yes, I have to replace the battery. I talked about that, um, I think, on a couple episodes ago. There we go. We'll talk about this dial. Uh, so I will share my experiences changing this battery myself after I go through that process. But uh, really interesting story about this watch. Um, I talked about this when I first saw it, but I had made the decision, I think, a, a couple years ago, or two or three years ago now, I wanted a Grand Seiko. But I wanted a quartz grand cycle. I didn't want a high beat or a spring drive. I specifically wanted a quartz 9F uh, Seiko movement. Um, the particular movement in here is the Grand Seiko 9F82 uh, um, movement, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So, But I couldn't find a 9F quartz that really spoke to me in a way that I wanted to be spoken to, if that makes sense. And I remember I was on Seiya Japan. I was on Seiya Japan just scrolling through for like the hundredth time. The Grand Seiko, <laughs> the Grand Seiko listings that he had on the website, and it was like, it was like midnight Eastern. Let me put this watch here. It was like midnight Eastern uh, at the time, and I don't know, I don't know if I if I slip into a fever vision or if I was caught in between site updates, but I went from like page three to page four of like the Grand Seiko section on on Seiya Japan's website, and when I did that. I was in like a different language version of the website and for a brief, brief moment, camera one, I saw this watch on his website and then the website refreshed and it went away. And I was like, oh, no, <laughs> that, that was the watch. That was my fucking watch. And so I ended up trying to figure out what was that watch. And so like, I ended up Googling like, like Grand Seiko Teal dial or something like that and through that process i was able to finally figure out what i had seen it is a jdm model it is not a usa model um 
is the SBGV233. I messaged Say and I said, hey, I thought I saw this watch on your website. Can you get it for me? He said, yes, obviously. I'm saying you're paying, I can get anything. He didn't say that, but that's 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 what he means, guys. All right, uh, and so that was it. That was that was that was how I knew this was the the watch for me. I was able to figure out the reference number. I contacted Say Japan. The transaction was great. Shipping was super fast. He showed it to my place, and I can definitively say, and it's not really a surprise. Of all the watches I own, of all the watches I own, this probably is the nicest finished, tightest QC timepiece I have. Everything on this watch is perfect. The size is perfect. The way it feels on my wrist is perfect. The weight is perfect. This is titanium also. That's the other really beautiful thing to me. It is it is so tight. And the 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 third the thermodynamics of titanium basically it takes on your body heat a lot faster than stainless steel would. So it's very easy for you to put this on. And then not be aware of like a temperature difference. So I'll be wearing this watch. This watch feels like this watch feels like coming home. This watch gives me the same feeling my Big Zero and my um, Seiko SNK do. But this watch um, is probably the nicest wearing experience I have in terms of fit and finish, quality control. Everything about this is perfect. All the the bracelet pieces are really really nice everything's tight nothing is sort of loose or kind of janky on here my only complaints with this watch uh, are the fact that these are not screw links these are pin and collar which was a bit of a pain in the ass um, and the other really funny thing is titanium is um, it's not necessarily quote unquote it's kind of scratch resistant because I think this is technically coated but it's also very impact resistant and everything like that but what's funny is this thing is really really hard to scratch the only thing that will scratch it is uh is itself so the only scratches this watch has this this watch has are from the bracelet rubbing up against itself there so not really a complaint just something i thought was kind of uh kind of interesting so uh this is the grand seiko 9f82 movement um this thing is plus minus 10 seconds a year so it's basically the most accurate thing in my entire house maybe next to my cell phone which is on i'm sure like a radio frequency uh atomic timekeeping and everything like that but um this watch is probably yeah this watch is incredibly special to me no other watch has a wearing experience uh like this i would encourage anyone remotely interested in grand seiko to check out the quartz movements and to check out, um, you know, uh, uh, the most affordable Grand Seiko you're going to see are going to be in like the Heritage Collection. Uh, I forgot the references um, that are in there, but simple three-hand quartz uh, timepieces. Definitely, definitely check it out. Oh, God, how, how uncouth of me. Dimensions. Ugh, savage. Uh, wearing uh, dimensions on the Grand Seiko SBGV 233R is 40 millimeters in diameter. It is 46 millimeters lug to lug, and it is... 10 millimeters thick or thin as it were so this is probably the the most mature version of kaz teal uh that i have in the collection now for for photographic purposes let me put all kaz teal watches together because i don't think i've ever had the chance to really ah, do that that is all three kaz teal watches the Orient Star Semi Skeleton Diver, the Grand Seiko SBV, SBGV 233, and then the Orient Neo 70s Christmas Chrono. Man. Yeah, I'll let everyone know how changing the battery, camera two, I'll let everyone know how changing the battery goes in the, um, in the Grand Seiko. All right, how are we on time? Whew, doggy. All right. What are we talking about next? Let's do it. Let's talk about one that's actually a little painful to talk about. We don't mind a bit of pain on this show. Let me switch here. Camera one, boom. Uh, oh, sorry, I had the wrong button. Camera one, boom. <laughs> yeah, I still have my Paul Yacht 3133. <laughs> 
Polyev 3133, this is a really fascinating timepiece. Um, in the history of Soviet watches, one of the hardest things for um, Soviet watch manufacturers, which I'll talk about in a little bit in a moment, very briefly, I promise, was nailing down a reliable, uh, fully Soviet-made chronograph. So the Polyev 3133 is the second iteration of a sort of Soviet-made chronograph. The first was the Strela 3017, which was actually originally... Uh, based on a Venus 150 caliber. So by based, I mean um, when the Soviets had to advance their orological technology, they either purchased rights and patents to other equipment or uh, like movement specs or, um, or they just copied it or they just stole it. Hashtag. That's just how that's just how it goes. Uh, in the case of the one five zero seven, I believe they purchased it. I can't say for sure, and I can't actually can't remember. But the Polyot, sorry, that I got shaky hands. The Polyot thirty one thirty three here. Sorry, I have my really bad allergies. The Polyot thirty one thirty three here is based on. Uh, it's actually based on the Valju seven seven thirty four, which the Soviets purchased the. Uh, the rights and the manufacturing equipment for they, they, that was actually one of the, the few recorded times they actually did purchase the rights to do as a, as a, rather than just copying it. So um, this is that so that, that that when I say the second iteration of like a sort of sort of semi uh, Soviet made chronograph, that's what I mean. You know, this is based off the Valju seven seven thirty four uh, movement. There's some pretty telltale characteristics. There's a there's a delta shaped delta like a triangle shaped bridge plate in the movement as well so this is not an exhibition case back and i'm not going to take this case back off i think i have taken it off in a previous video if not i'll make a video where i'll take this off and i'll talk folks through it a little bit if they want to learn more but uh pull out the 3133 this is a painful watch for me i don't wear this watch because it actually doesn't work anymore uh it winds it kind of runs but the chronograph just does not function anymore so this was um Switch here, camera two, boom. This was uh, this was a few iterations. There was the, there there was a period of time where slowly and slowly this watch was just kind of deteriorating, and it culminated, you know, I think about a year or maybe so ago, where it finally stopped working. So it's just kind of collecting dust. I think I tried selling it, but I ended up changing my mind. So I might try to get it fixed um, or worked on at some point. Uh, but for now, it's just going to sit on my shelf. That's the reality. In terms of wearing experience on this watch, it is 38 millimeters in diameter. It is 45 millimeters lug to lug, which actually makes it you know, pretty fun to wear. And it is 12 millimeters ah, thick or thin, as it were. I am wearing it on a early generation EA Leather Goods strap. This is a strap that I asked EA Leather to make for this watch. Uh, it's got the little speed racing holes in it. I don't know. I just thought it would look cool on here, and uh, uh, I got the uh, the, 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 the two-tone stitching that kind of matches some of the white and red um, markers in here as well. The whole presentation is very, very nice. It actually wears very, very well, which is why I'm very sad that I don't wear it that much anymore, but I am trying to not wear it so as to not uh, exacerbate whatever damage the, the, the timepiece has, 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 has you know, taken upon itself oh crystal so this is what i was talking about with the raketa big zero crystal the original raketa big zero crystal looked like this it is not a dome it is this sort of cylinder that's just like like chopped and just has this really straight edge there's no rounded bevel let me grab the raketa big zero so the original raketa big zero crystal would have looked more like this one on the uh polyot 3133 I'll probably do a separate video on the Polyot 3133. I have a piece on the website about the first Moscow watch factory. Uh, the history of the Polyot 3133 movement and just Polyot as a brand, oh, which, I have, which I have to talk about a little bit, is very closely tied to the first Moscow watch factory. So when I say Soviet brands, Soviet brands didn't function in the same way that privately owned brands do. Um, in the Soviet Union between 1917 and 1991 slash 1992, Brands didn't exist as private entities. Brands existed as fabrication. Uh, uh, how can I phrase this? As like fabrication divisions of the government. The government owned 
all facets of manufacturing and, and, and fabrication, industrialization and things like that. So it is really easy for some of those nuances to kind of get lost when we talk about Soviet watch brands. In the case of Polyot, Polyot was in the first Moscow watch factory and a lot of what they uh, did was provide, I think, a combination of everyday timepieces and specifically the first Moscow watch factory's area of expertise was um, chronographs for usage in military and um, you know space aeronautics and things like that. Which is which is which is what is which was the original iteration of the thirty one three three movement was for um, for the navy and military applications. So, uh, oh, it has a internal rotating bezel. That's what that that's what this uh, nine o'clock crown is. How cool is that? Man, I gotta get this watch looked at. All right, boom. Let's do this here. We have three more watches. Wow, it has been fifty five minutes. I don't know about anyone else, but I'm actually having a ton of fun. I don't get to talk about all my watches at once. Uh, so this is actually really really cool for me. Let's see, how are we doing this? Boom, let's do this. Let's talk about, oh, we're staying on camera one. Next watch up, the Omega Seamaster Professional Diver 300 millimeter, reference 2541, AKA the Golden Eye Seamaster. Uh, this watch was the result of a gift given to me by a very dedicated group of people Within the DBWS community and my better half and broke watch snobbery, Michael, they all came together. They got this watch for me. It uh, is probably the nicest thing that, you know, not a group of strangers because the TBWS community, the TBWS community is very, very close to each other and to me, even though sometimes I'm not very communicative uh, within a lot of those groups, but. This is probably one of the most nicest, unexpected things that I have ever received. Um, so I, I, I talked a lot about this watch when I first got it, so I won't, I won't go too much into details. But I'll always be appreciative and think of every single person that was involved in this watch when I put this watch on. Simply because it is fucking fantastic. Uh, in, terms of wearing, in terms of wearing experience, it is 41 millimeter in diameter. It is 47 millimeters lug to lug. And it is a very, very nice 11 millimeters thick. And that is due... in entirely to the quartz movement in here. The quartz movement in here is actually the Omega 1538 um, quartz movement. It is a six jewel quartz movement. Uh, generally, you can determine the quality of a quartz movement based on really if it has jewels or not. If it doesn't have jewels, the idea is that, oh, it's gonna break and you can just replace the movement. If it has jewels, they at least try to have some of the items uh, in it not rub up and get metal on metal friction. So the idea is that this watch is it's supposed to be a quartz watch that's hyper accurate, which it is, and it's supposed to last a long time, which it will. The Omega Seamaster uh, line is actually a ton of fun. It's gone through a few iterations. I really like this older generation, so this early, early generation, because the wave dial pattern, I guess they've kind of gone back to something similar, but this wave dial pattern is very different from some of the first ceramic ones that came out with the deep, deep wave, the deep wave dial. Uh, this is much more of an intricate and detailed and less deep wave dial. It is an aluminum bezel insert. It has this very, very nice characteristic bracelet. It does not taper. So it has the potential to wear a bit large on a 6.75 inch wrist. But again, I think the fact that we're only talking about ah, 11 millimeters in thickness or thinness, it is just perfect. I think Everything about this watch is ideal. The legibility off the bat wouldn't be necessarily very high, but when you catch it in the right light, because these hands are kind of skeletonized a little bit, then you can really get a good sense of the time um, and everything else uh, in regards to just trying to tell time on the watch. Has a helium escape valve, you know, for all those times when I'm, I'm resurfacing and I have to, you know, release helium from my watch, I guess. I don't really know. I, I, it, it's one of those, the dive watch thing is interesting. There's so many novelties and nuances and things like that. Even though this has no function, it is very critical to the overall appearance and design uh, you know, of this watch. The little Seamaster, let me get this in the proper light here if I can, Hippocampus, which is what that is, is pretty cool. Uh, I wear my watches very tight, as most folks know. So when I wear this watch particularly tight, I can see this logo imprinted on my arm, you know, which is always pretty fucking hilarious. But uh, this is probably one of my favorite sort of, this has become kind of a vacation watch for me. It, this, is, this is just like big, big, big time weekend vibes. 
So it's actually probably gonna wear this today because I'm recording this on the weekend. So that is that is the Omega. Let me go off camera too. Boom. That is the Omega Seamaster. There we go. In terms of my wrist size, if this if this isn't at all helpful for folks, six point seven five inch wrist. This is forty one millimeters, forty seven millimeter lug to lug. If this were one of the newer versions with the master coax movement and it was going to be thicker, it would probably be a little too big. I also don't like that. Uh, no, I also like that this watch doesn't have really a ton of polished or shiny surfaces. The newer Seamasters do, um, which kind of pushes it a little bit more into like a luxe watch vibe, which is not really what I would want from the Seamaster line. Uh, also, this watch is just special because it was the Golden Red Seamaster. This is one of the first times I saw a watch on screen that I recognized like later in life. And so this is a really nice fun piece to have. Uh, let's see here. That is the Omega Seamaster. Boom, camera two. 2541. Prices on these are going up, which is interesting. So I would definitely, there we go, keep an eye out on how things go. All right, everyone. We have two watches left. I'm going to take a sip of very fucking terrible coffee. God, that's so bad. Um, what are we talking about next? All right, let's do that. All right, we're on camera two. Let's go to camera one. Boom. Monta Triumph. This is a fantastic fucking watch. <laughs> The, the Monta Triumph is a, a, a multi-year journey that I had taken to determine um, kind of what I wanted as a new house slash new dad watch. I began this watch journey, I think two years ago, when we started going through the process of uh, house hunting. And then in the middle of the process of house hunting, um, we, we found out we were going to be having a baby. And so I'm like, okay, I need something that's like a quote unquote dad watch. But I didn't want like, uh, like a like a DW fifty six hundred or like a classic. Uh, let me go camera two. Camera two, boom. Or like a classic like retro dad's watch. I wanted something that was a uh, field watch style, that wore small. That was the very important thing for me. I'll talk about dimension in a second. I wanted something that wore small, and uh. I wanted something that was a little, a, not luxe, but a little elevated. I didn't just want like, if I just wanted uh, an everyday field watch, I would have gotten a Hamilton khaki, probably uh, a field mechanical, like the manual wine field mechanical. I will, I'll recommend Hamilton khakis for folks who want affordable field watches all the time. But I didn't want that. I wanted something a little bit different. I wanted something that had a bit more of a different feel. And so the Monta Triumph was really kind of always on our radar. Um, we've spent time here at TVWS with the Monta Triumph. I'm just moving it so you guys can see the logo. We've spent time with the Monta Triumph before here at TVWS. Um, and it was kind of on my radar for a little bit, but then they announced that they were going to be discontinuing this current generation of Triumphs. And in commemoration of that, they were releasing uh, these new green dials. This is a bit of like a... How would I, how would I, how would I describe this green? It's almost like a... It's not a blue green. It's more of a faded olive brown green, almost like a kind of vintage, not vintage military, but um, a weathered military green, if that makes sense. It is very, very deep. It is very, very wearable. It is green bordering on brown uh, neutral almost. But what ended up really sealing the deal for me was everything I had been describing about what I wanted in a field watch was basically this watch. In terms of wearing dimensions, it is 38.5 millimeters in diameter. It is 47 millimeters lug to lug. And this is an automatic movement that is 9.7 millimeters um, thin. I'll say thin. I keep saying thick, but it's basically thin. Uh, this thing gives me a damn near wear perfect like wearing experience, a damn near perfect wearing experience. And so everything I've been talking about that I wanted in a, a, a new dad slash new house watch it was basically this fucking watch. I wanted a field watch. This is a field watch. It has Arabic numerals. Um, it's not a field watch in the sense of having an internal, you know, 24 hour or uh, the internal uh, like like uh, ring for the military time. But to me, it is a field watch just in regards to full Arabic numerals, high legibility and sword hands. Those were my criteria for field watch. 
It is also a field watch style that is a little bit elevated, a little bit luxe. You know, the finishing on the case and the finishing on uh, the wearing experience of the bracelet in terms of like the crown, everything. Uh, the the very very minimal polishing that's there is done in such a way where it accents most of what is basically uh, a matte case. Um, and this was it for a long time. I didn't realize I was describing this watch. It wasn't until I saw the damn color <laughs> where I was like, oh shit, that's the watch. So Monta is a very interesting brand in the world of micro brands. I Michael and I have really been evolving our view. Let me switch here to camera too, so you can watch me drink my coffee. Michael and I have been evolving our view of micro brands recently to, to really start to bifurcate differences between micro brands and what we call boutique brands. And by boutique brand, I mean a brand that goes above and beyond what is expected of just a micro brand to check boxes. You can be a great micro brand and just check boxes. And by check boxes, I mean you know, I want an automatic movement. I want it at a certain price. I want, you know, XYZ dimensions and I want XYZ colors, XYZ, blah, 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 blah. There are certain fields and things like that, like boxes you can check for a micro brand. And then there are boutique brands which go out of their way to work with resources that are available to them to actually make something that is within a very distinct design language that is all their own. Monta is one of those brands that, that does that. Now, Monta is not a boutique or micro brand that has very, um, I don't have any here with me, uh, like loud designs. There are some micro brands that very, that very much focus on interesting color combinations or um, very attention grabbing dial or even case details. This is not that. The idea behind this is the balance between elegance and craftsmanship is the design language. And that's what I wanted. I wanted a watch that wasn't that was just going to be perfect for. You hear that bracelet? Uh, everyday wearability, and that was that was the Monta Triumph for me, honestly. So super happy with this watch. Um, I'm even kind of looking at making potentially another Monta purchase. It's a slippery slope. We might be doing a ten watch, state of the watch collection, uh, coming up, but. Um, I would encourage anyone remotely curious about Monta. We have some reviews on the site. Check them out. If you have any questions, definitely let me know. The oh oh yes okay so I have to talk about the bracelet really really quick because I was just I was just looking at my Grand Seiko bracelet and I wanted to remember. While the Grand Seiko bracelet, some of the finishing here for titanium is very very tight and very very uh, high quality. Like I recognize this feels like a very high quality bracelet. The actual wearing experience, I will say, is not as good as the Monta. And that's really because Monta put a lot of effort into the actual full articulation of these links. So these are traditional H links, but instead of being one solid unit, the middle segment rotates independently. And what that actually allows it to do is conform to rounder objects which is hopefully a wrist in this situation, uh, with a lot more comfort. And so this is actually a very comfortable watch. And the, the clasp experience, it is very, very secure. Uh, they're also, they're re-releasing a newer, or they have a released a new generation of this quick change uh, system they have here. But if you ever need to resize, or if it's, if you have wrist swelling or whatever, it's literally that easy. I keep mine over here on the highest one. Um, and so that the whole package just basically made this a watch that is going to be in my collection forever, I think. I do love this watch. And like I said, I'm looking, I'm looking at a, a, another Monta. So that is watch number eight. All right, camera change. I just scratched my eye. I appreciate everyone's patience as I work through... Uh, my new YouTube setup. I'm getting used to these lights. Any tips or feedback or critiques, please, 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 please let, let me know. This is all new to me. I am, uh, I'm a technology dinosaur, if that makes sense. God, that is terrible coffee. Um, so I just want to give that, just give a shout out to that before we get to, I'll put it here as a preview because everyone knows what it is. Before we get to the next watch, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm about to dive into my last watch here. Uh, again, I would encourage you to check this out on YouTube. 
If you haven't already, please subscribe to us on YouTube. Michael and I are trying to make a very strong effort at putting ourselves out there a bit more in regards to a video format. Hence a lot of the investment in these new resources, you know, multi-camera angles and everything like that. Um, I'm also going to start doing watch reviews. I have some watch reviews queued up from brands that we've never covered before uh, on this show, so I'm very excited to share that with people. Um, but if you have any thoughts or critiques about what we're doing, please definitely um, let me know. I would love to just do whatever is necessary to be more entertaining to folks. Um, that was something of a bit of a interesting... Uh, I've been having a lot of, a lot of existential crisis crises recently and i've been trying to figure out the base underlining common denominator about everything i'm passionate about and i think that underlining common denominator about everything i'm passionate about if y'all don't mind me getting philosophical for a moment is i genuinely do like entertaining people uh probably for selfish reasons it makes me feel good it makes me feel good to know that i'm talking about something that people are enjoying and that i'm doing it in a format that people enjoy and if i can make someone laugh or make someone just not feel alone because i think it's really easy especially in watch collecting especially in this like brave new world we're in where it's, you may work remote like me and you might go days not actually talking to people it is really easy to feel alone so anything we can do to book watch knobs to connect better with folks do that in a format that's easier for people to just kind of like throw on in the background and hang out with us. Um, I just want to do more of that. So without any further ado, switching cameras, boom. <laughs> Let's talk about my last watch. Let's talk about the Slava Medical. Let me move the hands so you can see. Yeah, can you actually see everything that's happening here? Oh yeah, let's actually just, let's, let's, let's just set it in real time. It is Friday, I got the day right. Let's set it to the correct time. The Slava Medical is a very interesting watch. Uh, historically within Soviet urology and personally, which is, well, I guess I had it at the right time for it. God damn it. And personally for me, um, at the same time that I found out about the Raketa Big Zero, here they are, pictured together for your viewing pleasure. At the same time I found out about, about the Raketa Big Zero, I learned about the Slava Medical and I was fascinated totally fascinated this uh the slava medical is a mechanical pulse meter mechanical pulse meter is a complication which is these two scales here not really a complication it's more of a a, a a scale measurement the pulse meter scale are these two different scales here and the idea is that you are supposed to wait for the second hand to get there you're then supposed to find your pulse and then you're supposed to count how many pulses i'll tell you right now I believe it's 15. You're supposed to count 15 pulses, and then after you count 15 pulses, wherever the second hand is, that is your heart rate per minute. Uh, the idea is that it was supposed to be a very quick way, I think, for Soviet medical professionals to take um, blood pressure on the fly. Now, there are other pulse meters in Soviet urology, but they're quartz. There's the there's the Chaika, I'm probably not saying that correctly, so I apologize, which is quartz. And then there's also a Raketa quartz pulse meter, which is pretty cool looking, actually. Uh, the problem with all the old quartz pulse meters is that um, more often than not, someone left a battery in there. So they're usually inoperable or they're just covered in battery gunk because the batteries will leak acid if it's left in there for too long and everything like that. But this is uh, the only mechanical one. So the Slava Medical in terms of a wearing experience is actually a very beautiful watch to wear it has a very unique wearing experience being a rectangular case this case style i think we've talked about in the show previously this case style ah, is called the slava fridge case because i guess it looks like a fucking fridge i don't know it's just a big <laughs> it's just a big rectangle but in terms of uh, millimeters here it is 36 millimeters in kind of sort of diameter it is 44.5 millimeters lug to lug, and it is 12 millimeters thick, uh, including the crystal. It's probably about 10 millimeters uh, without the crystal. So being a pulse meter, it is incredibly important for this watch to be accurate, which is why the other uh, Soviet pulse meters that exist are uh, quartz. Quartz is going to be more accurate than mechanical watches uh, basically every time for the most part, you know, being reasonable. Uh, that's just the reality of it. But in the case of this, this actually uses the Slava 2428 uh, movement. 
I actually do have a video on this watch where I open this watch up and I go and look at the movement and I talk about how pulse meters work and everything like that. I'll try to make sure to include a link to that here um, as well. But this is using the Slava 2428 movement, not to be confused with the Eta 2824. The Slava 2428 is an uh, interesting movement in that it is a double mainspring barrel movement. So basically what that means is, uh, let me find, uh, sure. This uh, Orient Star uh, diver has the F6 R42 caliber movement in here. This is only working on, let me see if I can actually get it. Can I get it in frame? Ah, uh, you can't see it. Oh, you can kind of see it. Sort of. You can't really see it. There is only one mainspring barrel in most traditional uh, mechanical watches. And so by mainspring barrel, I mean when you, when you wind a watch, when you wind a mechanical watch, when you, when you, if you can wind, manually wind a mechanical watch, what you're winding is a little tiny flat spring that's wound uh, in a metal cylinder, kind of like a, kind of like a, I'm really sorry, like a mint tin. You ever see those old round mint tins? Imagine that with a flat, like tape-like metal spring in there. And imagine as that winds, that spring creates uh, tension. That tension is the power reserve. That tension is actually is what creates the the necessary movement to propel the gears and everything like that because as that spring releases its tension that's what the measurement of time is you're, when we're talking about the idea of virology and timekeeping we're measuring the time we're measuring the time it takes for energy to deplete at least for me that's how i that's that's how i conceptualize it. and so we're measuring the time it takes for the power reserve of a watch to deplete now, in regards to accuracy, on a single mainspring barrel watch, or at least this is the theory when they were working on these 2428 Slava movements, the idea with a single mainspring barrel is as that tension depletes, the accuracy of the watch changes because the tension is not constant. As the tension loosens, the force, you know, either one way or the other way, will not be the same as it was when the watch was more tight. And as it loosens more and more and more, that accuracy uh, will not be consistent. The idea... Again, I, I'm not a watch tech. I'm not like a proper watch person. I don't know if this is true. <laughs> the idea, and I'm pointing, I'm pointing them because they're they're about no, they're actually they're actually about right here. The idea with the double mainspring barrel is that as tension is released in two mainspring barrels, it is supposed to compensate for that loss of accuracy. So you don't get as much of a loss of accuracy as uh, energy depletes in a dual mainspring barrel movement, which allows you to potentially be a, a, feel a little more confident in your pulse accurate your, your kind of uh, uh, pulse rating accuracy here so again I don't know if that's actually true but that was I think some of the initial idea with the impetus of using the 2428 movement here instead of just trying to use um, a quartz movement uh, like some of the other watch brands were doing so um, but this is a really really fun watch you don't see too many of these come up for sale these days. Um, you'll see a lot of Franken versions. You can tell Franken versions uh, pretty easily. You know, sometimes the hands will be different. Sometimes this outer layer, you can see this outer layer here has this step versus this inner layer. A lot of times Franken versions will have these from two different watches and those two different pieces will deteriorate at different rates. So one will be more discolored than the other. You want these two parts to be as close in color as possible to give you a higher statistical confidence that you're dealing with something that is mainly accurate. Uh, this also has the correct case back with the Soviet star and the CCCP on there. Disregard the reference number. Reference numbers are basically goddamn meaningless uh, for, <laughs> for most Soviet watches. Um, but this is a really, really fun watch. It took me a long time to get this watch. So... Um, Oh, also, you change the date down there uh, with this little button that you can press. This is actually really similar to the old date change mechanism that was on the um, first generation Mako. If you remember the first generation Makos, it had a button. Very similar idea. Press the button, change the date. Uh, I just screwed all this up, so I'll have to change it, fix it afterwards, but that's fine. Um, 
it took me oh god several years to finally get this watch you know in the heyday maybe one or two would come up for sale online uh, but they're either overpriced or there was odd provenance behind them i was able to find this through um someone selling it in the usa guy bought the watch a while back thought it was cool he was graduating decided to sell it and now it's here this has the proper crown and everything too you can see it has a little bit of a point on it so I actually ended up selling this watch during the great um, watch purge to uh, an amazing member of this of the, the, the TBWS community so huge shout out to Ben for um, buying this watch and honestly being a very nice steward and taking care of this watch he allowed me to buy it back from him you know when I finally come to my fucking senses to realize what I've done uh, and so I'm very happy to welcome this watch back into the collection. I don't worry this too much, honestly. Again, I am afraid of something ha happening to it, especially because I'm here in Florida. I have humidity. I don't want to bang this thing against a door sill or anything like that. But if I'm just having like a day home where I know I'm working on calls, like um, like work from home stuff, like you know, I'll usually wear this watch. So uh, let me see. Did I go over? I went over dimensions. That is it, everyone. Let me put them all out here again. Try to minimize the glare you're getting. There we go. That is the Slava Medical. That is the Grand Seiko SBV, SBGV233. That is the Orient Star Open, the Orient Star Semi Skeleton Diver RK 80106E. This is the Omega Seamaster Professional 300 meter quartz reference 2541, the GoldenEye reference. Uh, this is not the order that I read them in, so sorry. I'm just ordering. I'm, this is the order that I'm grabbing them in. This is my very beloved Seiko SMK805, now discontinued and then replaced by the Seiko 5 Sports Field Style Collection. I have no idea. Uh, this is the Manta Triumph. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Uh, this is the Orient Star Christmas Chrono. This is the Raketa Big Zero. And last, certainly not least, my old Polyot 3133, and I gotta figure out, gotta figure out what to do with it. So, with that said, let me go back to camera two. Boom! Thank you so much for the time, everyone. That was actually a ton of fun. I hadn't really gone through a rundown of the collection like this in a long time. Appreciate everyone putting up with me working through a lot of these technical pieces and me going through my uh, allergy attacks, which is always really fun to go through. Um, dealing with my really, really bad coffee. Huge shout out again to everyone that is jumping on YouTube and checking us out. Please go and um, subscribe, comment on this video here. I'm doing my best to get back and respond to folks as they comment. I do believe that, uh, how can I phrase this? You all make me a better person. And I am not being facetious or odd. If I did not have TBWS, if I did not have Mike, if I did not have this community, and if I didn't have this hobby to really uh, pour a lot of my passion into, I don't know what I would have. I mean, obviously I'd have my job and my family and everything like that's great, but like everyone needs things like this. Like you need something to be amazingly personally passionate about. And for me, it's watches and it's everyone uh, at TBWS. So thank you so much for joining me. Please let me know your thoughts on this episode. Please go and check out the YouTube video. Um, I'll also try to put some fun uh, shorts or reels. I have no idea. I'm technologically illiterate. I'm going to figure out how to make some reels or whatever the hell out of this for Instagram as well. I want to be a little more active on Instagram. I'm trying to improve my uh, photography game as well. Um, but with that, I think it's that sad time. I'm going to do the, the, the outro on, on my own, which is always interesting. But let's do actually a camera one shot of everything. Look at that. That's all the watches. That's my entire watch collection. Wow. It actually makes me really happy to see all these guys. Okay. All right. Enough sentimentality. Appreciate everyone's time. Go and let us know your thoughts. Head up to hit up to bookwatchnows.com. We're doing our best to keep that site updated as well. We're going to be working on some changes there. Uh, let me know if you have any questions on any of the pieces that I've talked about. If you want to see anything specific on YouTube as I keep putting up more videos, definitely let me know. But otherwise, ow, that's sad time. Everyone, Thank you for listening. This is Kaz. You have been listening to Two Rope Watch Knobs. Later.